Well, my name is Paul Anthony Stephen Clark, and I say that to people whenever I sit down with someone that I don't know. I usually start with my name. It's kind of like the you know, conventional icebreaker, but I also kind of ask, you know, what is your name and how did you get it? And I explain my name and where it came from because I didn't choose it. I chose the Stephen part, which I'll get to in a second, but I didn't choose the first two it were given to me or a gift by my mom and dad. And for the first three days of my life, I was Anthony Francis. And then on the third day, they looked at me. And this is, you know, my mom and dad who are living in Little Italy in Cleveland, Ohio. And they knew, they knew that I would be called Tony. There's no way I was going to be called Anthony or Antonio. And so they said, you know what, he's just not a Tony. So they renamed me. On the third day, they renamed me Paul Anthony. And Francis kind of got buried for a little bit. And when it came time uh, to discern what special patron, what special friend I would ask to accompany me on my life and confirmation as just a special guide, I was thinking about Francis, but uh, there were other names that just kind of spoke to me. And I guess I start with the name because of you know, where I come from, you know, my family, being a very strong Catholic family, but being a family, uh, my mom and dad were both converts from Episcopalianism and that really, or Anglicanism, and they, their desire for the, the Eucharist, their desire to receive everything that God was offering to them really drew them into the Catholic Church. And I remember growing up, they, uh, they would pray over us. When there was a big event going on in the family, they would invite us to be the center of a circle. And then they would put their hands on our head, on our, on my, you know, they would invite my brothers and sister, sister to put their hands on my shoulder and just they would allow the Holy Spirit to just fill the room and just pray and ask the Holy Spirit to guide, you know, me during that moment. And then I would be invited at a similar time to pray over my brothers or sister. And I kind of thought this was a very strange action for a Catholic family, but it was in, an action that just you know, that I remember feeling so at peace in the fire of that love, that this was my true home. And it was when we were kind of lifting each other up, when we were, they, I didn't belong to them, they were offering me up as a gift. And, and I would be returned to them a better, a truer son. Um, and so that is, that is a little bit of, of the, the family life that kind of brought me here. But if kind of, calling the call to the priesthood is one that I have been praying about and I, I love t telling this story as well because it's one that each time I tell it there's something new there's something that is unheard of for me it's an opportunity that I can just share with the person I'm like wow did that just did that really just happen and I went to a, a really a good Catholic high school in Cuyahoga Falls Ohio it was a Jesuit high school and I was very much an introvert I was, a I was a perfectionist. I wanted to get everything done absolutely right the first time. And I say that just because I was terrified of being in big groups. I did not want to be there in the commons when all my peers would be there gathered around me. I didn't know what to say. I, I didn't have any witty stories to tell. So all I had was just my isolation, you know, just this kind of sense of, I don't, of being lost in the world. And so what did I do? What did I do? I went to Mass, and for the first time, I went to Mass by myself. And I went at first just to kind of, you know, get away um, from everyone else. But then in a chapel in the round that could see 800 people, there were about 40 people who showed up. So it felt like it was just me and the Lord. I did that every day. And over this time of four years in high school, I must say that the strength, the confidence of standing with the Lord, the risen Lord, the crucified and risen Lord, gave me a... Uh, just a peace, it drawing me more and more out of myself into be a servant. One of the mottos of the Jesuits is um, men, they're educating men and women for others. And I just really thought, wow, you know, just the, the desire to serve, to give of myself. And that was something that really connected with me as I grew up. So you know, kind of see this introverted kid become someone who is really oriented towards the other, towards uh, being a servant. And I desired that so, so much to serve others. And going to college was one where I was like, well, Lord, how? How? And, you know, like, in what way? You know, please call me. And I had gone to visit the minor seminary in, in, Chicago, in Ohio for the Diocese of Cleveland. And I was just, no, no, absolutely not. It, it was just the immediate sense of that's not where my call is. Let's move on to the next thing. The no sense of, you know, maybe I should give it another shot. Absolutely not. I went to college, got involved in a really great you know, prayer group, 
um, started to really articulate, learn to articulate my faith, defend the faith, go to Bible studies, and fall in love with the Lord more and more, wanting to know what He wants for me, spending time with Him in adoration and uh, talking to friends about Him and hearing friends who were discerning vocations with the Jesuits or thinking about diocesan uh, priesthood for the Archdiocese of St. Louis. By this time, I'm in St. Louis University. And you can kind of see that, you know, these different questions are, are coming back at me. And I think one of the things that really, you know, sparked for me was it was a, a retreat that I went on my senior year in college. It was a silent retreat it's a, kind of in the Jesuit model, taking the spiritual exercises and allowing the, the different meditations, meditations of a scripture, to really help us guide, it, you know, guide our discernment. Where have we come from? Where are, we, where are we and where are we going? And um, I just remember going to my room one, uh, one afternoon. I was given a question by my spiritual director. When have you felt most at peace with God? And I thought, okay, relatively simple question. Once I get done with this question, I can move on to other, other plans I had. I was still very noisy on the inside. And so I took this question. I started writing it out. I started writing out these moments when I had felt just on fire, burning. One of them was you know, in, in, at home with my family as they prayed over me. The other was one that just really started to pop out in my mind and popped out in the way that the Lord was speaking to me. And it was when I was a, an altar server back in my home parish in Ohio. I was asked uh, to serve the Good Friday service. It was my very first time doing it. I'd been to Good Friday services before, and so I'd seen you know, what was going on, but you know, actually serving, it was a whole nother, uh, it was a whole nother deal for me. And I remember Father McNeil, he, he told us exactly how to go through it. We practiced beforehand. And one of the first things that uh, the service called for was prostration by the priest. And, you know, he said the, the altar servers are fine prostrating as well. Now, as a second grader, maybe a third grader. I had no idea what prostration was, nor did I have any idea what the symbolism was. Um, all, I know, all I knew was that he told me, you're going to, uh, you know, going to kneel, and then you're just gonna lay face down on the carpet until I get up, and then you can get up too. And I'm like, this is kind of a strange way to be in front of all these people. I really felt awkward. Um, we're doing you know, the practice, this is really, really bizarre. When the time came for the service, and as we approached the cross, and uh, you know, we went off to our either side, the two servers, and he you know, led us in the prostration, and then I just laid there. And I felt I never wanted to move. It was a prayer for the first time as a, as a young man, I was offering my life, and I felt that this was the perfect form, the perfect posture of prayer, where I lay down my life and I put it in your hands. And when I saw him get up, I was like, oh. But it was, and I didn't know how to interpret it. I didn't know, I didn't ask. I, it was so personal that I didn't have any desire to share it with anyone. And so later on, I would find out after going to my first, after seeing um, ordination, after seeing the sacrament of holy orders administered, I would see that same form of prayer, that same form in which either to the transitional diaconate or to the permanent diaconate or to holy orders. And then also similarly in the religious life, for female religious, they also prostrate, that sense of submission. And uh, so I was in my room, fast forward back up to college, I was in my room kind of meditating on all these different things, and I just had the overwhelming, you know, just desire for priesthood. And I was nervous because by admitting it to myself, that means I'd have to admit it to someone else. This means my plans weren't going to cut it. What I wanted to be an ambassador, you know, to bring people together on the political stage, to, um, to bring about change and to help people get over their differences, might have to be accomplished in a different way. I still might be able to bring people together, but not in my way, in God's way. And it all came together and I said, God, you are not wasting anything. And all of my studies in college have not been just in vain. You are helping me understand your very person, who you are and who I am in your eyes. And I want that more than anything else in the world. And I, I told my spiritual director what had happened. And he's like, and I was giddy. I was exalted. I was like bouncing around the room, kind of like I want to be doing right now. And you know, I, 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 he's, I told him, what do I do with this? Where do I go? He said, go to the Lord. Go to him in the blessed sacrament. Just speak to him. 
and I did, and I do, and I continue to just say, Lord, I give you my life. I lay it down. Help me to rise in you, to rise with you, to serve the people as you would have me serve them, to be a priest, your priest, and always that direction. And um, as I've mentioned, I'm not from New Orleans. One of the things that uh, after graduating from college, I had this, you know, it was my senior year that I'd gone on this retreat. And I, uh, you know, I was like, all right, Lord, well, what do I do with this? Do I, you know, just study for the Archdiocese of St. Louis? Do I go back to the Diocese of Cleveland where I, I really did not feel home at all? Um, do I look at a religious order, the Jesuits? I went to a Jesuit university, Benedictines. Uh, who had helped form me in prayer, Franciscans, you know, all these different options. And I felt, again, that confusion. And the Lord said, wait, wait. Yeah. You know, do, you know don't, don't hurry. I'm in no rush. Why are you in a rush? And after Katrina, after Katrina I really wanted to help in some way. I felt um, you know, just really strong about coming down and, and volunteering. And so in August of 2006, I, dis I organized it with my older brother, John. We decided uh, that we'd be able to come down in, uh, he'd, be, he'd be able to come down in October, I could come down a little bit beforehand. So I took a train from Chicago to New Orleans. Um, I, I told the taxi driver that I'd be going to somewhere called Violet, Louisiana. I don't know if this place actually exists, but this is what the website told me. And that I'd be staying at an elementary school that had been turned into a volunteer, uh, volunteer house. The Center for Habitat for Humanity. And so I worked. It was a very simple life of ora et labora, prayer and work, where in the morning I would be more devoted to the liturgy of the hours, to the divine office. Um, I would work cleaning out, gutting out houses, getting to know the people of St. Bernard Parish and uh, later on the people of New Orleans and Plaquemines and you know, of all these different areas that I just had no idea about. And I felt more and more that I was being adopted. And I, I will never know um, what it's like to be an adopted son for the great gift my parents have given me. But I just knew that this is, it's true family. It is a true family, that their story that they were sharing with me, that their life that they were sharing with me um, was not one that I had to, to do anything for. I didn't deserve it. I just listened and we shared. We were family. We shared food, we shared fellowship, we shared prayer. Um, and we, you know, we worked together. And I did this for about three years. And you know, through this whole time, um, just kind of coming to know the Lord more, prayer, um, spiritual, great spiritual direction, and seeing the model of incredibly holy parish priests, seeing that uh, lived out in a, such a joyful, joyful way, knowing confidently um, that their lives are not their own, that they are true fathers that they have been called to be a husband and father, to be the bridegroom in Christ, and, their and to be a father of all the children in their congregation, by extension, New Orleans, you know, the Archdiocese of New Orleans, and the, the Church Universal, the Body of Christ. And I just uh, have been reflecting on that great gift and been thanking the Lord for those many examples of holy men um, who have just witnessed to me the beauty and the power of parish priesthood and diocesan priesthood. And I continue to kind of draw great strength from their witness and their yes.